understand that you guys had your first uh, solids and fluids lecture today, right? Um, so you guys went over the shear, uh, the Young's modulus and shear modulus. Oh, yesterday? Yeah, sorry. Um, and so uh, our first question is uh, on a Young's modulus, and we've got a car that's being towed at a constant velocity by a small truck, uh, and it's uh, using a tow rope which has a tensile Young's modulus of 8.4 times 10 to the power of 8 and a diameter of 1.5 centimeters. The rope was initially 4 meters but stretches an extra 1.5 centimeters when the car is being towed. So we want to find out what the tension force is in the tow rope. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, whoever's up there, can you... Uh, <laughs> Just like, because it's just distracting us. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Um, so the Young's modulus is a measure of how much an object will stretch uh, when you exert a tensile force on it. Okay, so the equation for Young's modulus is stress over strain. Okay, so the stress is how much uh, force per area you're exerting on the object. So stress is force per area, force over area. And then strain is uh, the change in length. So if you try and stretch out an object, exert force, exert a force, then it's going to change length. Um, and then that's over the original length of the object. Okay. So This is our equation here. So we've got um, F over area over um, delta L over L up. Okay. So here we are trying to look for the force variable. So what's the tension force in the tow rope? Okay. So uh, we have to rearrange this equation um, for force, um, and because it's you've got two fractions there on top of each other, it's going to be quite hard. So I just recommend that you uh, have your equation rearranged for each of these variables on your cheat sheet. So for force, it's going to be um, the Young's modulus multiplied by the change in length multiplied by the area, and that's over the original length. Okay? So, um, with this one especially, I like to write down the variables, uh, the value of the variables that I've got, um, so we can do the conversions before we um, put them into our equation. So, our first value there is the Young's modulus. So, we've got a Young's modulus of 8.4 times 10 to the 8 pascals. So that's in the correct units, we don't have to uh, convert that. And then we have a diameter, right? A diameter of 1.5 centimeters. Um, but we don't actually need the diameter, what we need is the area. So we need to have the area, and what that is, is the, that's going to be the cross-sectional area of our rope. And if it has a diameter, it means that it's a cylindrical object. Right, so it's got this diameter here, and what we want is to find out the cross-sectional area. Okay, so if you cut it and look down at it, if you, if you cut this rope and you're looking down at it, you want to find out this cross-sectional surface area. Okay, and the equation for that is A equals pi R squared, where r is the radius. So we've been given that the diameter, which is, uh, so diameter equals 1.5 centimeters, and we need to convert that into meters. So center is times 10 to the negative 2, so we're going to replace that, 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2 meters, right? And then 
you want. So radius is going to be equal to half of that, so that will be 0 0.75 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. Or alternatively, you could just write 0 0.0075 meters. Okay, so just add another two zeros to that one. And you can just write it like that. Okay, so then we'll need to figure out what our cross-sectional area is going to be. Um, and that's going to be 0 0.0075 squared, okay? And that will give you an answer of 1.767 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. So that's your area, the cross-sectional area of the rope here. So I'll write that down here. Okay. Um, and so... Next, we're told that the rope was initially 4 meters long, so that's the initial length or the original length. So that's given the variable LO, and that's just going to be simply 4 meters. And then we need to have delta L, so it stretches an extra 1.5 centimeters, that's going to be our change in length. And again, 1.5 centimeters has to be converted into meters, 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. Okay, so now we've got our variables and we have converted them before entering it into our equation. So now it's just a matter of um, plugging our numbers in. So that's going to be Young's modulus 8.4 times 10 to the 8 times our change in length, which is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2 times our cross-sectional area, which we calculated from the diameter. Um, and that's over the original length, which is 4. So if you put that in your calculator, you should get 556 newtons. Okay, and that's going to be round to 560 newtons, which is your answer, okay? So, um, you'll notice here that I went up to four significant figures. Um, if you, like, so when, when you're trying to get, when you get intermediate numbers, uh, while you're still, while you still haven't got your final answer, I'd just recommend, like, going up to at least four or five significant figures, um, otherwise you might get rounding errors later on. Okay, so if you just did 1.76, you'd probably, you'd get um, 554, which would then round to 550, um, and that might confuse you a bit. Like, all the other options are far enough off that you'd probably choose E, but you might be unsure, you might think you got the wrong answer. So it's, that's just a good idea, good habit. Don't round too early. Um, so number two, your flatmate has a bad cut on her foot and you lie her down and raise her foot so that the wound is 1.1 uh, meter. Um, so here's my beautiful foot and it's connected to the body and that's that's <laughs> uh, uh, so <laughs> so this height is one point one meter um, yeah, so that's the elevation, so the the, the, the foot is uh. 1.1 meter higher than the heart. Um, so you guys, oh sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I forgot to mention, like, I'm going to go over things that you haven't covered in your module yet. Um, and I thought it'd be good to 
uh, go over solids and fluids today or this week because that way you get two two weeks on bulk and oh, sorry two weeks on solids and fluids and two weeks on thermo and then you have your mid stem uh, just because I thought like you probably don't need to do two weeks on mechanics okay um, so yeah just be aware that you haven't oh, you haven't like um, gone through these lectures yet so some of it <laughs> Some of it uh, may be quite unfam unfamiliar, but don't be too worried, so I'll just try and go through it slowly. Uh, so um, in order to solve this question, you need to understand one basic principle of liquids, um, and that's the fact that um, if the liquid is connected, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, wrong <rub> this. <laughs> um, okay, so that's not as bad. Um, so, if you've got a container and the liquid is connected so as long as it's at the same height it's going to have the same pressure so for example this the pressure at the surface um, at both surfaces uh, will be the same because their height is the same so let's say this is p1 and this is p2 so then p1 will equal p2 okay and similarly, if we picked another height here, let's say this is P3 and P4. So they're at the same height. So the pressure at this point and the pressure at this point will be equal. So the only thing in a liquid that's going to determine the pressure is the height. Okay? Um, and the, so the pressure at the surface of the water will be equal to the pressure of the atmosphere or the gas that's above it, right? So uh, let's say the atmospheric pressure, so the pressure of the atmosphere, which this container is open to, let's say it's 101 kilopascals, which is your normal atmospheric pressure. So that's the pressure that's surrounding us all the time just from the air then pressure one will be equal to 101 kilopascals so the pressure at the surface of the water and because this is also open to the surface this will also be 101 kilopascals okay so just remember that uh, if it's the pressure at the surface of the water will be equal to the pressure um, of the gas or the atmosphere that it's exposed to um, and so then we know that this pressure will be different to the pressure at the surface, right? Um, and which, which one of these two will have higher pressure or greater pressure? Yep. So the one that's lower, right? Um, and that's because we have more... Uh, so this part here just has the air pushing down on it, whereas this point here has the air pushing down on it as well as all the liquid um, on top of it pushing it down so that's why at this point here the pressure will be greater okay um, so as you go lower as you go uh, lose height the pressure becomes greater okay and that's important to understand um, so lots of people get confused by this so uh, if you so this this vessel is connected, so this part is connected to this part, right? So these rules apply. Uh, if you think of the body, our blood vessel, our blood is all connected because they're all part of the same blood vessel system. So that means that uh, the pressure um, at, in my right, the blood pressure in my right shoulder should be equal to the blood pressure in my left shoulder, right? Because they're at the same height. But the blood pressure in my head is going to be less than the blood pressure in my heart because my head's at a higher height. 
and the blood pressure in my feet will be higher than the blood pressure in my heart because it's lower, right? And that's why you get like um, accumulation of blood in your feet. Uh, so these same rules apply um, and there's an equation that you can use uh, to figure out, uh, to calculate the difference in pressure. So, so delta P, the change in the difference in pressure, is equal to this symbol here, which is rho. So that's the Greek letter rho. It looks like a P, um, but it's the Greek letter rho. And that's for density. So that's the density of the liquid. Okay. And then that's multiplied by the value of gravity, multiplied by the difference in height or the change in height. Okay. Um, so, and you'll come across something called the gauge pressure. So, uh, there's two types of pressure. There's absolute pressure and then there's gauge pressure. So gauge, that's spelt G-A-U-G-E. I say gauge, but some people might say gorge. Um, yeah, just say gauge pressure. Um, so absolute pressure is the value here. Uh, so it's like the actual number, whereas gauge pressure is in comparison to the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so then this pressure here, so, so the, sorry, so I'll, the pressure at this point here, the gauge pressure would be zero because it's equal. So P gauge at this point here would be equal to zero pascals because it's equal to the atmospheric pressure. Okay, whereas at this point here, the gauge pressure will be greater than atmospheric pressure, okay? Because um, it's, yeah, it's, so uh, that's what they mean when they say gauge pressure. Um, yeah. So then we'll return to this problem. Uh, We've, we're trying to find the blood pressure um, at her foot. So the blood pressure at her foot is equal to question mark. And we know that the blood pressure at the heart is equal to 120 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so... Um, Remember that we have to convert this into pascals. So, uh, to convert that into pascals, you're going to con you're going to multiply that by 133.32. So that's just the value you use to convert conversion value. Um, so you should have that on your cheat sheet as well, because they won't give that to you on your formula sheet. What they tell you is uh, 101 kilopascals is equal to 760 millis of, millimeters of mercury, but good luck trying to use that to convert your values, because that's a bit confusing. Do you ever convert? Sorry? Yeah, so... Yeah, just use this. Like, this is the easy way to do it. But if you try to use, like, do it like this, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's just harder. <laughs> Yeah. So just try and make things as easy for yourself as you can. Um, yeah. So if you do that, we're going to get a value of fifteen thousand nine hundred and ninety-eight pascals. Okay. So that's the blood pressure at our heart level, at the height of our heart, um, which is equal to the pressure in their bicep because it's at the same height. Okay. Um, and then. So because we have an elevation, a difference in height, we're going to have different pressure between the heart and the foot, and we can calculate um, 
this change in pressure between these two heights by using the equation that I just showed you. So delta P is equal to rho, the density, times gravity times the change in height. Okay, so our density of blood, the liquid, is blood, so that's 1060. Uh, so they'll always give you the density, yeah, of whatever liquid you're using. Um, so times 10 times the height, which is 1.1. Okay, so that will give you 11,660 pascals. Okay, so that's the difference in height, oh, sorry, difference in pressure between these two points, between the heart and the foot, and that's due to the difference in height. So now we have these two numbers, uh, what are we going to do with them to get the pressure in our foot? So uh, is the pressure in our foot going to be more or less than this number? Yep. No, no, so, uh, no, yeah, this, yeah, it's higher, so yeah, so it'll be less, right? So we know that the, this one will be less, and we know the, the magnitude of the difference, so we'll just subtract 11,660 from 15,998. So that means um, the pressure of the foot is just 15,998 minus 11,660, which will give you... Um, 4,338 pascals, right? But we want to have our, um, our final value, that should be in millimeters of mercury, so we have to convert it back into millimeters of mercury. So if we multiplied it by 133.32 in order to convert into pascals, we can just divide it by 133.32. So we're going to do that, 133. 33.32, and that's going to give you uh, 32, uh, sorry, 33, yeah, so, uh, yeah, 33 millimeters of mercury, okay? Yep. It's rho, the Greek letter rho which is written like a P, but it's not a P. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It stands for the... The density of the liquid. Density. Yeah. Sorry, um, yeah. it might be so weird to ask this, but why did you take like the pressure of the foot, blood in the foot away from the heart? Oh, because uh, what we've done is we've, we know they've given us the pressure in the heart yes. and we know that the pressure in the foot will be less than the pressure in the heart. Okay, so what we can do is we can calculate the difference between the heart and the foot. So this is the difference, the, the difference in pressure between the two points and we know that this is going to be less than this one, so then we will have to minus it in order to get the in order to get this value. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So our next one, we have a cylinder uh, which has a radius of two centimeters. It's closed at one end and has a movable piston. Um, so this cylinder contains a gas at atmospheric pressure. Uh, how much extra force must you apply to the piston in order to increase the pressure of the gas inside the cylinder to, inside the cylinder to four times atmospheric pressure? Um, so. We're going to write down uh, the, the values that we've been given. Um, oh, sorry. No, we'll do it another way. So 
we're looking for how much extra force we have to apply to the piston, right? And it's to do with pressure. So um, one of the equations for pressure is this one. So uh, the change in pressure is equal to the change in force divided by the area. Okay, so um, because we're looking for the change in force and we know that it's to do with pressure, we'd, we'd, we'd look at our cheat sheet and we'd use this equation here. Um, so we can just rearrange that to look for force. So that's going to be delta F is equal to delta P multiplied by the area. Okay, so um, the change in pressure, that's going to be uh, the final pressure minus the initial pressure. Okay, so what's the change in temp uh, sorry, what's the change in pressure going to be? So, um, so let me just go one step back. So we know that initial pressure is atmospheric pressure, right? So that's 101 times 10 to the 3. And what's our final pressure going to be? Four times atmospheric pressure, right? So that's 404 times 10 to the 3 pascals. Okay, so then we want to find the change in pressure. So that's final minus initial, and that's going to give you 303 times 10 to the 3 pascals. <laughs> okay, so that's our delta P. Right? <laughs> oh, so that was just pi equals 101 times 10 to the 3 pascals. <laughs> okay? Yep. So that, that final pressure is just four times the initial pressure, which was atmospheric. Yeah. Okay. All right, so then um, what we need to do is we need to calculate the area. Okay, so that's going to be the cross-sectional area. And again, we've been given the radius. So remember that um, area is equal to pi r squared. Okay, so, so that's the area... the area for a circle. So you should also have you should also have this on your cheat sheet. So the area for a circle is pi r squared. Because um, this is important, you'll be they'll just give you the radius and you have to know the area. So if you don't know if you don't have this equation, then you're not going to be able to solve your problem, right? Because you need to find out the area from the radius. Uh, and Another one that you probably won't use as often, um, or you probably never have to use, but I'll just have it just in case, is the circumference. Yeah, so put this on your cheat sheet. The circumference of a circle is equal to 2 pi r. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's just for the cheat sheet, so I'd just put that on as well. Um, I don't really think you have to use that any time, but it's, yeah, it's just, just in case. And then, so, and then also the volume of a sphere is equal to 4 over 3, 3 times pi uh, cubed. Okay. Okay. Everyone got that down? Yeah, so put that down in your cheat sheet as well. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so we need to calculate our area. So area is equal to pi r squared. And so our radius is 2 centimeters. Remember that we have to use the meter value, not centimeters. So that's going to be uh, 2 times 10 to the negative 2 squared. Okay. And that's going to be uh, 1.2566 times 10 to the negative 3 meters squared. Okay? So again, just going up to five significant figures there because this is not our final answer. Okay, so now we have our, um, our values and we can calculate the change in force that's required. So change in force is equal to our change in pressure, which is 303 times 10 to the power of 3, multiplied by the area, which is 1.2566 times 10 to the power of negative 3. Um, and that's going to give you 380 newtons. Okay, so pretty simple, as long as you know um, that pi r squared. Okay. So moving on to our next question. Um, now this one's about buoyancy. So if you have an object uh, in water or any sort of liquid, it's going to displace that liquid in order to get into the liquid, right? So if you think about, um, if you have a cup filled to the brim with water and then you put anything in it, so let's say you put an ice cube in it, it's gonna overflow, right? Um, and that's because the ice cube has a volume and it's gonna push out or displace the same volume uh, that it is okay so when you um, when you push out that volume of water that volume of water is going to try and push that object back out okay so there's going to be a buoyant force acting on that object so we have um, a cannonball sinking through water, right? It's sinking through water and because the volume of the cannonball has displaced some water, uh, the water is going to exert a, what we call a buoyant force. So buoyant means like floating. So it's going to exert a force upwards on the, on the ball to try and um, get it out. But of course, the this cannonball has a mass, and presumably, if it's sinking, that means that the that means that the weight force from the mass of the ball is greater than the buoyant force. So that's why it's sinking, and that's why it's not floating. If the weight force was smaller than this buoyant force, then it would be floating, okay? Um, an important thing to know is that, so you're going to have the density of the object, right? So if you think of, like let's say lead, it's very heavy for the same uh, like volume, whereas a bag of feathers can be the same volume but it's uh, much lighter. So that's what density is. So the, if the density of the object is uh, less than the density of the liquid that it's in, then it's going to float. And if the density of the object is greater than the density of the liquid, 
then the object will sink. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward, right? So if the density of the liquid is greater, then it will float. If the density of the object is greater, then it will sink. Okay? Um, important to realize that. Okay, so now is the formula. So the buoyant force, the equation is the density of the liquid multiplied by the volume of liquid that has been displaced multiplied by gravity. Okay? So here we know the density of the liquid, so that's water, so that's uh, 1 times 10 to the 3, which is just 1,000, so 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And then we need to know the volume that of liquid that has been displaced. So because the, the whole sphere or the whole cannonball is inside the water because it's sinking, right? So the volume of liquid that's been displaced will be equal to the volume of the sphere, right? So volume displaced will be equal to the volume of the cannonball. And we need to calculate the volume of the cannonball. So this is another um, uh, equation that you should have on your cheat sheet. And so that's volume is equal to mass over the density. Okay, so you should have that as well. Um, because in these solids and fluids uh, questions, you're going to use this a lot. Uh, just volume in general, yeah. So this is just for volume, so this is just for your cheat sheet. Okay, so if you have, <laughs> if you have the mass, the density, or the volume, so if you have two of those, then you can calculate the third one, okay? Um, and it's quite common that you have to use this equation, so get familiar with it. And so then, we know the mass of our cannonball, so it's 11.85 kilograms. And the density of our cannonball is 7.9 times 10 to the power of 3, right? So that's going to give us uh, a volume of 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 meters cubed. Okay, so that's the volume that's been displaced and then we all know what gravity is, just 10. So now we're just going to put in our numbers, 1000 times the volume displaced, which is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 times 10. So that's just going to be 15 Newtons, okay. So if you're given mass and density, you can calculate the volume, All right? So our next one, we have a large bronze statue which sinks until it rests on the bottom of the ocean. The density of bronze is 8.2 times 10 to the power of 3, whereas the density of seawater is 1.02 times 10 to the power of 3, and the volume of the statue is 0.14 meters cubed. When the statue reaches a depth of 20 meters, what's the magnitude of the buoyancy force on the statue? So the thing that we're looking for is the buoyancy force. Okay. And the equation for that is uh, the density of the liquid multiplied by the volume of liquid that has been 
displaced, multiplied by gravity. Okay, so we actually have all the variables that we need. So we know the density of the liquid. That's the seawater, right? Um, so that's going to be 1.02 times 10 to the power of 3. And the volume of liquid that's been displaced is going to be equal to the volume of the statue, right? Because all of the statue is inside the water. It's at the bottom of the ocean. So our volume is 0 0.14. And of course we know gravity. So that's just going to be 1430 newtons. Yeah, number five? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in this one, uh, you were given some unnecessary information, so you didn't need to know the density of bronze, uh, and you also didn't know to know the depth of 20 meters, uh, so those pieces of information was irrelevant, okay? Um, yeah, so, so they do put in information that doesn't matter, um, so it's up to you to be able to determine which information you need to solve the problem, okay? And that's why it's important to identify uh, what variable you're actually looking for, so, you need, so then you know what do I need to figure out uh, what I need to know. Yeah, so I'll go over that. That's the next one. Yep. So, uh, so now we have a toy submarine uh, and a volume of 200, and, uh, 200 centimeters cubed and it's floating on the surface of fresh water with 30% of its volume uh, above the water. And we want to know the mass of the submarine. Okay, so I'm just going to draw this cube because I can't draw a submarine. You've seen how shocking my drawing skills are. Um, so we've got 30% um, right above the water. So how much is below the water? 70% right. You guys are all geniuses. Um, so uh, yeah, so that means that 70% is what we call submerged. Um, submerged just basically means it's below the water. Um, so you need to understand this rule. If 30%, oh sorry, if 70% is underwater, that means that the density of this object is 70% of the density of the liquid that it's in. Okay, so the liquid has a density of 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. So this is the density of the liquid, right? If 70% is submerged, it means that the density of this object the density of the object is equal to 70% of the density of the liquid that it's in. So 70% of density of liquid. Okay? So that means, so 70% as a decimal would be 0 0.7 times 1000 so then the density of our object is 700 kilograms per meters cubed okay yep why is that or because not um well i don't know that's just how it is <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, I don't, I don't know how, like, I don't really know why that is. Like, it's just that if the density is half, 
then um, half of it will be submerged. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, just just how it is, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, because we know that seventy percent of it is underwater, that means that the density must be seventy percent of one thousand. Okay. So. And then, so the, the mathematical equation for that is going to be volume of the object that's submerged over the volume, the total volume of the object is equal to the density of the object over the density of the liquid. Okay, so that's the mathematical um, way of putting that. So the, the proportion that's submerged, so in this case it would be 70 over 100. If the volume of the object was 100, it would be 70 over 100. And that would be equal to 700 over 1000. It's the same proportion, right? So the proportion that's submerged is equal to the the proportion of the density of the object and the liquid. So that's another one that should be on your cheat sheet and you should understand what it means. Uh, so now we figured out the density of the object and we've been told that the volume of the toy, the volume of the object, is equal to... Um, 200 centimeters cubed. So, how would you convert that into meters cubed? Yep, so, uh, yeah, you're right. It's uh, 200 times 10 to the power of negative 6 meters cubed. Okay, so I'm going to just write down these conversions. So, you had your straight. Um, meters, nanos, conversions, your prefixes, but now you also have your area, your, your squared values, your squared and your cubes. So it's just easier if you write this down in your cheat sheet and then you can just use it. So centimeter squared is equal to times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. Centimeters cubed is equal to times 10 to the negative 6 meters cubed millimeters squared is equal to times 10 to the negative 6 meters squared millimeters cubed is equal to times 10 to the negative 9 meters cubed okay so um, these are your conversions so just write that down on your cheat sheet. So here you can see you've just uh, replaced centimeters cubed with times 10 to the negative 6. Okay, so a quick explanation of why, so I'll just show you an example of this one, why it becomes times 10 to the negative 4. Okay, so let's say you had a square, or more like a rectangle, but yeah, so one centimeter length, or uh, height, and one centimeter uh, width. Okay, so if you want to find the area of that, that'd be one centimeter <coughs> times one centimeter, which would equal one centimeter squared, right? So then now we're going to do it in meters, so that's 0 0.01 meters, and this is 0 0.01 meters. So now you're going to find the area, but in meters or meter squared, so that's 0 0.01 meters times 0 0.01 meters. And so then you're going to have four zeros, <coughs> so that's going to be 0 0.0001 meter squared, which is the same as 1 times 10 to the negative 4 meter squared. Okay, so that's just a quick explanation of why you get these conversion factors, okay? But you don't have to worry about this, you can just write this down in your cheat sheet um, and that'll be quicker. Yep. So the initial flight, 
Yeah, so if you have 200, then you leave the 200 and you just add this prefix. Oh, yeah, this, um, this conversion. Way, you yeah, you divide it. Yeah. But you'd really never need to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so now we have, so we're looking for the mass, and remember that if you have the volume and the density, you can calculate the mass, okay? So it's the trio. If you have two of those uh, values, you can calculate the third. Um, so mass is equal to density times volume. So that's just the previous, uh, the previous equation that we used in the last question, rearranged for mass, okay? So our density is 700, and our volume is 200 times 10 to the negative 6. So that's going to give us 0 0.14 okay, kilograms. All right, so that's our answer. Mm, yeah, and as long as you know that, understand the rule, that if 70% is submerged, that's going to mean that the density is 70% of the liquid that it's in. Um, yeah. And pretty much any question that involves floating objects, you're going to use that rule. So it's very critical that you understand that. Um, and if you can use that rule, then it's quite easy to solve most of these questions. So we have a large cubical water tank um, and its dimensions are 3 meters on each side. Right. Um, and it's filled to the brim and they've opened a hole in the, in the bottom of the tank. Right. So if you open a hole um, in the bottom of the tank water's going to start rushing out. Okay, so we want to know the speed, the velocity of the water that's coming out of this hole. Um, so I can, like, if I wanted to, I could go through, like, the whole huge, um, like, proper way to do it, but then uh, that's not really ne necessary. Uh, so what you do, what you would just use here, is this equation here, the velocity is equal to 2 times gravity times the difference in height, okay? And if you remember from our mechanics lecture, that's the same one we used when an object was falling from a height and we wanted to calculate the conversion of potential energy into kinetic energy, right? And you want to find out the velocity after that lost potential energy. So that's the same equation. Uh, so you can just think of it like a water molecule is falling from the top of the surface here and it's going to come out this end. So it's like kind of like the same principle but the force of gravity is like obviously it's not the water molecule at the top that's coming out but the force of gravity is being transmitted through all of these water molecules because that's it's a liquid. Okay, so the velocity of the, um, the water coming out of here is going to be the same as if you just dropped an object from this height um, and it was, it was accelerating from free fall. So 2 times 10 times our height, which is 3 meters, right? So then that would be... Uh, 7.7 .7 meters per second. Okay? Um, yeah. Like yeah, so that, that just means that we know that the height is 3 meters. Oh, right. Yeah, oh. because, yeah, so that's just, that's what it's telling us. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the important thing to 
So you might say, what if, what if it wasn't asking, what if it was asking how fast it'd be coming out this way? Would that be different? Yeah. So this makes no difference. All you need to worry about is the height and then the difference in height between the surface and the hole which is coming out of. Okay. So it doesn't matter whether it's, even if it was like, say, oriented upwards, it, it would still be like the same velocity. Okay. Um, so that's just a quick and easy way. Uh, so the next one. Uh, we have a large piano weighing 500 kilograms. You'd like to lift this piano using a hydraulic lift as pictured below. Um, Cheers. Okay, so um, this is the surface area here is A1, right? And this is what we want to find out. And uh, the surface area here is 0 0.3 meters squared. And so you are able to, so you are able to exert a force, right? So you can change the force, um, and that value is uh, 700 newtons. 700 newtons on this side, so we'll call that delta F2, the change in force 2. Um, and then the amount of force that we must exert on this side, right? Because if you want to lift a piano that weighs 500 kilograms, you're going to have to exert at least 5,000 newtons, right? Because the weight force is going to be uh, 500 times 10, mass times gravity. So the change in force one is going to be 5,000 newtons, okay? Uh, so the principle that you have to apply here is that the change in pressure at this point on this side is going to be equal to the change in pressure on the other side, okay? So this is how hydraulic pumps work, so delta P1 is equal to delta P2. Okay, and remember that we had our equation, so delta P is equal to delta F, the change in force over area, so we used that equation earlier. So that means that the change in force 1 over area 1 is equal to change in force 2 over area 2. Okay, so now uh, we just want to find out A1. So we're going to rearrange this equation. So then we're going to, so we want to bring A1 to the top, so we're going to flip it. So that's A1 over delta F1 is equal to A2 over delta F2, and then we're just going to multiply both sides by delta F1, so F1 is going to come up here, so then uh, A1 is equal to A2 multiplied by delta F1 over delta F2, okay? So we'll just put in the numbers, A2 is equal to 0 0.3 times delta F1, which is 5,000, and that's over delta F2, which is 700. And that's going to give you 2.14 meters squared. Okay?
It's got a cork sphere with a diameter of 50 centimeters is held underwater so that the center of the sphere is at a depth of six meters. Okay. And then we've got the density of water, we've got the density of the cork, and we've got the volume. Oh, so we have the equation for the volume of a sphere. And we want to find out uh, the difference in pressure between the top and bottom of the sphere. So our sphere is here, and it's got a diameter of 50 centimeters, which is 0 0.5 meters. And it's at a depth. It's at a depth of six meters. Okay, so we want to find out the difference in pressure. So we want to find out the difference in pressure between this point here and this point here, right? So uh, we're going to do that. So delta P is equal to the density of the liquid times the gravity times the change in height. So what's the difference in height between here and here? 0 0.5 meters. So, and it's going to be the density of the liquid. Uh, so that's density of water, which is just 1,000 times 10 times 0 0.5. So that's going to be 500. Oh, sorry. That's going to be 5,000 pascals. And 5,000 pascals is 5 kilopascals. Okay, so that's option C. And then now we want to find out how much force we have to exert downward on the sphere to keep it submerged. Um, sorry, so this is actually going to take a while. Um, So we've got the sphere, and it's submerged at this depth, so it means that it's not moving up or down. It's just staying at the same height, so there's zero vertical movement or zero vertical acceleration, so it means that the vertical net force is zero. So that means the forces up equal the forces down. Um, so the upwards force, is going to be the buoyant force, which is the water pushing up on the sphere. And then you're going to have a downwards force from the weight So you're going to have a downwards force from the weight of the sphere, so that's equal to mass times gravity, which is, uh, so the mass, yeah, so it's going to be the mass of the cork times gravity, but we, we haven't been given the mass of the cork, so we have to calculate it uh, using the density and the volume. Um, and then so, because the buoyant force, so if you, if you look at the, uh, the density of water versus the density of cork, the density of cork is only 200 kilograms per meters cubed, and the density of water is 1,000. So uh, if something is less dense, it's going to float. Okay, so that means that the buoyant force is going to be larger than the weight force. So we have to apply some extra force to keep it submerged at this depth. So we're trying to find out how much extra force we have to apply in order for 
the downwards force to be equal to the upwards force. So that's what we're looking for. Okay. So in order to do that, um, well, we already know what the upwards force is going to be, so we just, um, oh no, we haven't. So the buoyant force is equal to the density of the liquid times the volume displaced. So that's going to be uh, the, vol uh, the volume of the cork, but we don't know that yet. So what we need to do is we need to calculate the volume of the cork. So volume is equal to 4 over 3 pi uh, cubed. Okay. So they've given us the diameter, and remember that radius is half of the diameter. So that's 4 over 3 times pi multiplied by the radius. So that's going to be half of the diameter. Our diameter was 0 0.5 meters. So our radius is going to be 0 0.25 meters. Okay. So I'd probably write down, so the volume of a sphere is uh, this equation here, and I'd probably write that down in your cheat sheet as well. Like, there have been problems in the past where they haven't actually given you that, and then sometimes they do, so it's pretty inconsistent. So I'd just have it down on your cheat sheet um, just in case. So that's 6.545 times 10 to the negative 2 meters cubed. Okay, so we've got a volume. So now we can calculate our upwards force. So density of liquid is 1,000 times 6.54 times 10 to the negative 2 times 10. So that's equal to 654.5 newtons. So, and then the weight force is equal to mass times gravity, but we don't have the mass, so we're going <coughs> to, mass is equal to, mass is equal to density times volume, okay? So that's going to be the density of the cork multiplied by the volume of the cork multiplied by gravity. So the density of the cork is 200 or 0 0.2 times 10 to the 3 times the volume of the cork which is there. So we know that the weight force is going to be 130.9 newtons, okay? So, so far we have a 654 newton upwards force and a 131 newton downwards force, okay? So we need an additional force to make our downwards force equal to the upwards force, okay? So the extra force must just be 654.5 minus 130.9, okay? So that's going to equal 523.6, which is going to round up to 524 newtons, okay? So that means our extra force downwards is going to be 524 newtons. Yeah. Um, I kind of didn't realize that this was a hard one. So this is actually quite a difficult one. So yeah, it's not, not, a, not an easy one. So it should, this one should have been in the next tutorial, but I kind of got, um, I didn't look at it too hard. Um, it's hard to tell which ones are going to be hard and which ones are going to be difficult, uh, easy. Yeah, all right. Um, so the next one will start in five minutes. Okay, so cheers.